I'm going to attempt to preach this morning. I don't have much of a voice, as you can tell. Uh, yesterday, it was completely gone. At least it's back today. Praise the Lord. So turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. And uh, if I follow the pattern for the last few weeks, I'll only keep you about 20 minutes. I uh, listened to the last couple weeks of messages, and I was a bit short-winded uh, after months of preaching for an hour. So I guess I'm giving you a Christmas present. You only have to listen to me for 20 minutes. Matthew chapter 1, we're going to read verses 1 through 3 and then jump down to verse 16. The record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron and Hezron the father of Ram. Jump on down to verse 16. Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. I want you to say this phrase, from where he comes. How many of you know a little bit about your genealogy? Anybody looked into it a little bit, maybe traced it some, looked at, looked at your family line, looked at you know your descendants and... Um, I, I've done some of that over the years, and uh, the story that I, I found in my genealogy was quite shocking, but nothing compared to the story of Jesus' genealogy. When we really look at it, the bloodline of Jesus, our Savior, is surely a story of the grace of God upon a sinner, and it includes great and noble people as well as notorious sinners. Now, when I look at my family line, there's some great people in my family line, and then there's some real notorious sinners. Anyone ever heard the name Joseph Smith? Anyone ever heard that name? Founder of the Mormon church? Yeah, so my great uncle was his first cousin. My great uncle to the fifth, uh, his name was Edward Hunter. He built the tabernacle in Salt Lake City. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Come from a line of cult people. But God redeems. Hallelujah. And then in my family line, I've got those who worked with people like Smith Wigglesworth and new sister Edder and, and our five generations of Pentecostals. You know, so uh, our, our genealogy can be interesting. But when we look at the, the genealogy and the line of Jesus, it's a message to us that even the most hopeless of people from the most broken background can become one that brings blessing to many. And the amazing thing is, is that the line of Jesus is a kingly line. He's called the son of David. But the first remarkable person that I want to look at is Tamar. Her story is one of intrigue, fear, outright immorality. I mean, I said for the last couple of weeks, right, when we read the Bible, I read it like a soap opera. Like, I mean, it's days of our lives in scripture. Like, we read this, and I'm going to read out of the Message Bible this morning, Genesis 38, about that time, Judah separated from his brothers and hooked up with a man in Adalam named Hirah. While there, Judah met the daughter of a Canaanite named Shua. He married her. They went to bed. She became pregnant and had a son named Ur. She got pregnant again and had a son named, son named Onan. She had still another son. She named this one Sheila, Sh Shilah, not Sheila. <laughs> That's the southern pronunciation. They were living at Kazib when she had him. Judah got a wife for Ur, his firstborn. Her name was Tamar. But Judah's firstborn, Ur, grievously offended God, and God took his life. Wow. So Judah told Onan, 
Go and sleep with your brother's widow. It is the duty of a brother-in-law to keep your brother's line alive. But Onan knew that the child wouldn't be his. So whenever he slept with his brother's wife, he spilled his semen on the ground so he wouldn't produce a child for his brother. God was much offended by what he did and also took his life. Don't like you, dead. Don't like you, dead. So Judah stepped in and told his daughter-in-law, Tamar, live as a widow at home with your father until my son Shalah grows up. He was worried that Shalah would also end up dead, just like his brothers. So Tamar went to live with her father. Time passed. Judah's wife, Shua's daughter, died. When the time of mourning was over, Judah with his friend Harav Adalam went to Timnah for the sheep shearing. Tamar was told, your father-in-law has gone to Timnah to shear his sheep. She took off her widow's clothes, put on a veil to disguise herself, and set at the entrance to a name, which is on the road to Timnah. She realized by now that even though Shalah was grown up, she wasn't going to be married to him. Judah saw her and assumed she was a prostitute since she had a veiled face. He left the road and went over to her. He said, let me sleep with you. He had no idea that she was his daughter-in-law. She said, what will you pay me? He said, I'll send you, he said, a kid goat from the flock. She said, not unless you give me a pledge until you send it. So what would you want in the way of a pledge, she said. Your personal seal and cord in the staff you carry. He handed them over to her and slept with her, and she got pregnant. Y'all. Like, do any of you read this and go, what is happening? Like, this is the Bible. I'm not reading the tabloids. This is the Bible. Of course, eventually to the shock of everyone, it was proven that her father-in-law had, got, had made her pregnant. I mean, first of all, like for a goat, like, <laughs> like, did you read that? Like, did you hear that? Give me a kid goat, not even a full grown goat, just a baby goat. That's bad. But I want you to think of this, okay? Out of this shocking event came Perez. Does anyone remember that name? We read that name. If we go back, it says Judah was the father of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron. And Hezron the father of Ram. And we follow it down that Perez was, a direct, was in the direct lineage of Jesus. But he was a child conceived from prostitution. Regardless of it being... Tamar or not, it was prostitution. Conceived from the backsliding behavior of one who had been a great man of God. And it challenges anyone who would consider that they're of no worth. It challenges that, that the classic symptoms of this background of identity crisis. I mean, it's, it's reinforced. I mean, here you go, that mom gives birth to twins. One child's hand appears, puts a scarlet thread around the hand. The hand is drawn back. Out comes Perez. They call him the breech child. I mean, can you imagine walking around for the rest of your life being called breach? <laughs> like, you read the story and it's so full of just all this drama. But it's a story that's repeated time and time again. I mean, you, I, I feel bad for Perez. Because then his next brother, Zerah, is called the Rising of the Sun. Anyone ever felt like that in your family? Like, you're the breach and the rest are the Rising of the Sun? I mean, I knew someone named Mara, Bitter Waters. Like, why would you name your child Bitter Waters? Hello, little Bitter Waters. I mean, the story, you, you, you can imagine that it's full of conflict and sarcasm and, and no doubt a little bitterness between the brothers. Look at me, I'm the rising of the sun. Look at you, you're just a breach. You're just a mistake. And through no fault of his own, Perez is tainted. And it would cause him to struggle with his self-worth. And yet God chose him. Just like God is not biased regarding where you've come from and what you've done, that he delights in turning our past into a life of present blessing. And out of this mistake, out of the mistake called Perez comes a king. You get that this morning. 
the most important belief we must have of ourselves really has nothing to do with who we are, but the fact that we have Christ in us, the hope of glory. That this is the mystery, Christ in us, the hope of glory. A king lives within us, that we carry the life of a king inside of us. And Christmas is a message of a coming king. Yes, he physically came, but even more, he came to live within us. And even more than that, he's coming back. And that as a king, he enables us to rule as kings. The second remarkable person when we come down the line is Rahab. I mean, as demonstrated here, she was the mother of, Bro, uh, of, of Boaz. And only a few generations later, David is born. But remember who Rahab was? She was the harlot of Jericho. Ev Listen, everybody knew who Rahab was. All right? She was the one that hit the spies when they went to spy out the land. Her actions in Hebrews 11, though, were called an act of faith. James speaks of her as being justified by her works. Here she was, the woman who had prostituted herself. And whether in the re Jewish religious culture, or even our culture today, prostitutes were despised. But God has a way of redeeming even the most despised in this world. Acts 10.34 says this, And Peter opened his mouth and said, most certainly and thoroughly, I now perceive and understand that God shows no partiality and is no respecter of persons. The message is this. Your background can be redeemed. Your background never needs to be a hindrance to becoming a greater blessing to others. I mean, when we look at the genealogy of Jesus, Abraham was a liar. Jacob was a cheat and a deceiver. Judah committed incest. David was an adulterer and a murderer. Rahab was a prostitute. Ruth wasn't even a Jew. Manasseh was a wicked king who sacrificed his own son to Baal. And our lives. Church, you've got to get this this morning. Because when we understand from where he comes, he comes from this broken, broken line. And yet he comes as Messiah. That our lives, once taken hold of by God, can in every respect rever be reversed toward becoming a person cleansed, healed, and ready to carry a line of blessing for others. Christmas is about seeing a brighter future. But here's what I want to say to you, is that in our backgrounds, when we begin to understand that we all have these stories, but when we begin to work together, because our stories are so unique. This is what Psalm 133 declares. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, coming down upon the edge of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon coming down upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forever. When my story connects to your story, because my story is only my story when He redeems it. When I begin to walk in the redeemed story that God has given me, and I begin to connect to your story, and we begin to work together and walk together, it is there in that place of unity where I lay down my needs and I care for your needs and you care for my needs. It is in that place of unity that God commands a blessing. Unity is something so greatly valued by God. And where he came from is story after story after story of unity. And I believe that in this hour, one of the greatest challenges to the church in this hour is will we walk together? Will we live unoffended? Will we live unoffended at each other? Because what I also have to recognize is that each one of us are in the process of working out our salvation. Each one of us are in the process of letting God iron out some of the details of our lives. And listen, when you get in the fire, sometimes you smoke a little. <laughs> and I can't be offended by the smoke coming off your head because you're in the fire. When we're in the process of, of this purification that God takes us through and we're in the process of crushing, He's changing our form because His ultimate goal is for us to be conformed to the image of the Son. 
And when we work together in that, when we recognize that I'm called to walk alongside one another, I begin to value your story and the redemption that he's got, that he's brought to your life. Because I get to see a part of God that I could never see if I didn't know your redemption story. I get to know God as a redeemer in your life in a way I don't know him as a redeemer in my life. Because he redeemed you from something different than he redeemed me from. He's writing a different story. Ultimately, it's the same story of redemption. And man, I look forward to the day that he redeems us from this, this atmosphere of sin. Hallelujah. I never want a sore throat again in my life. Actually, it's not sore. It's just that I don't have a voice. I sound real Pentecostal this morning, though. I'd make the Pentecostal heritage proud. <laughs> but I'm saying this this morning because I believe that when we begin to understand and recognize your story and my story come together as his story, I begin to recognize that maybe some of the things that you're going through can testify to what I'm going through. And if I just look at it at surface level, I can get offended at your story. Right? We can do that. We can look at how God is ironing out some of the details of each other's lives and we can get offended by it. Or what we could choose to do is be part of the process to make each other more like Christ. To, to believe the best about each other. Wednesday night at prayer, we prayed into unity. It was so beautiful. It was incredible. But you know what happens when we pray into things like that? It gets challenged. It gets tested. The enemy loves to hear our prayer and then go, let me make you live that out. <laughs> you want to pray for blessing? Let me challenge your blessing. Let me also say this. God loves to challenge our prayers. You want to ask me for that? Let me let you work it out, son. You want, you want greater anointing? Let me crush you some more. I stopped praying for more anointing. People, you say, don't pray for patience. Why? Because he'll give you opportunities to be patient. But, but here, here's the reality is that, is that if we are going to, to see lives transformed, if we are going to see people encountered, equipped, if we're going to see those things, it's going to take unity. And when I understand where you come from and I understand a little bit more of your story, that's why relationships in the church can't be shallow. Because shallow relationships get swept away. But he's called us to be oaks of righteousness planted by the river. They ain't going nowhere. They're steadfast and immovable. So no matter how fast the river's moving, no matter what's coming through the river, I'm stuck. And I'm holding fast. And I recognize my roots are connected to your roots. Because the oaks planted by the river, they're all interconnected. All their roots are so tangled up, you can't tell whose is whose. And that's what he's calling us to, church. Not just a, a working unity. See, I think sometimes that we mistake in church as, as, oh, well, unity is when we're just working together on a project. Right? We're just we're decorating the church for Christmas. We're in unity. That, that's so surface level. I think sometimes we define unity as just being in agreement. That again, unity is to a focused outcome. But it again only lasts as long as there's agreement. True unity is tested when there's disagreements. Listen, I'm married. I know what disagreements look like. But I can't file for divorce every time there's a disagreement. We work through the disagreements. So, so can I be in unity with someone I disagree with? Absolutely. Because we work it out. We walk it out. And there in unity is the commanded blessing. I think sometimes we look at unity as being part of the community. And for whatever community comes together to do a task. You know, so maybe it's. Oh, we see this huge need on the other side of town. We all come together and we feel so great and then the task is over and then everyone just goes home and there's no relationships built. But then there's unity based around God's way of unity. 
family unity. <coughs> In Psalm 133, it says, for brothers, that word brothers there is more than just the, the idea of, of natural brothers. It is, it is a, a Hebrew word, brethren, which goes into the idea of interconnected family. It is that family unity that is so highly prized by God that brings anointing and refreshing. Because the reality is, if you walk into a place, anyone ever been into a place where you can just feel the division? You can feel the strife. You can feel there's just there's something in the atmosphere. Anyone ever gone over to a family member's house and you know they just had a fight? <laughs> Wife is cold as ice and husband's just staring at the football. There's no communicate. You just know something has happened. The reality is you may be doing all, all the right things as a church, yet if there's no unity, there's not a commanded blessing. We can come in on a Sunday morning. We can sing the songs. I can preach the word. We can have an altar service. And all of you go home and never build relationships with one another. But if we want the commanded blessing of God, this is the challenge in 2024. This is what we prayed into Wednesday night. And this is the challenge I'm issuing to this church. Is that if we want the commanded blessing of God, we've got to go to another level of unity. We've got to build some relationships that are so interconnected that our roots are indistinguishable. We've got to be so unoffended by our process. That's why I started with saying knowing where he came from is so important because when I begin to understand your story and you begin to understand my story, maybe you don't get offended at some of my quirks. Maybe I don't get offended at some of your quirks. Maybe our quirks work together. But see, I've, I've been in places, and, and we can all relate to that, where you feel the tension, where there's a lack of peace in the house. But on the other side, where there's a group of believers in harmony with their lives being honest and open to one another, there's huge blessing there. You feel the peace. And that's why Ephesians 4.3 says, Be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That's why it's so important. To pay attention to one another's needs. That's why it's so important that we give preference to one another. If we see someone without a seat, make room for them. That's as simple as it gets. Colossians 3.14 says this. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. I've given you almost two messages this morning, but I'm going to wrap it up this morning. Ben, can you come play for me? I don't think we turned it. Oh, we did turn it on. Good job, Ben. Psalm 133 says, The blessing that comes is a command from God. Rather than waiting for something better to come, God looks down on us and is so moved by our love and unity that he just counsels with himself and Bam, he releases the blessing. When we begin to walk in unity, church, and we begin to remain unoffended, and we begin to decide, I'm going to link together with one another. And I'm going to, listen, unity is a fight. It's, it's a fight. There can be a temptation to be an island unto ourselves. It's really easy. I may act all extroverted, but I really enjoy my time by myself. And for the introverts in the room, we'll get you delivered. Up and out. I joke, but I really believe that in 2024, God is building something within this house to set a pattern for where we're headed. And then he wants to command a blessing of unity in this place. He wants to command a fresh release of blessing in this house. So I started with, know where it comes from. If people don't know your testimony, they can't connect to the power of your testimony. 
When we look at the genealogy of Jesus, we see this incredible story mapped out of how God used broken people to bring the Messiah to heal their brokenness. There are broken areas of your life that God has healed and redeemed and restored. And when you share that with someone, it becomes life to them. There's stories I've heard in this room that have brought life to me. He's like, wow, if God could do it in them, I know he can do it in me. And so if you're not sharing your story with someone, if you're not building that relationship, if you're not walking in that unity, can I encourage you this morning? Do it. Do it. Build some connections. Build some relationships. Be genuine. Don't be a fake Christian church. Don't, don't play church. I tell people all the time, I can stand in a garage all day long. It's not going to make me a BMW. You can sit in church. You can sing the songs. You can say amen. But where the rub comes is, am I doing what he called me to do? Am I being a believer? Am I connecting? Am I investing in relationships? I know, listen, we all have church hurt. Right? We, we, we've all been hurt in church. Every single one of us could point to something that's gone wrong in church at some time. But can I tell you, at some point in our life, we got to choose to believe that God is bigger than that. Like, at, at some point, can, can I just... I'm going to take you into a therapy session for just a second. My therapy session. I was talking with my therapist. Yes, I see a therapist. About some stuff that I'd gone through. And this is what he said to me. He said, Jacob, we have rehearsed this. He said, I have your story memorized. You have said that same line every time you've walked in my office. At some point, are you going to let it go now? We've prayed through it. We've counseled through it. Now it is your responsibility to let it go. If you've never counseled through it, if you've never prayed through it, that's a good place to start. But if you've done all that you know to do, at some point, we just got to let it go. And just trust that he's big enough and that he's good enough. And listen, that the blood will never lose its power. That the blood still works. That it still heals and it still delivers. And that he's the same yesterday and he's the same today. And when you wake up tomorrow, he's still going to be the same God. That he is the one who redeems my story. He is the one who steps out of eternity and he stepped into my present and he called me by name and he said, I'll set you free and I'll deliver you and I'll make you whole because that's who I am. I know your story, but I'm writing a new chapter. So I know the hurt's real, church. And I know it's scary. It can be scary to form new relationships because it requires vulnerability. But if he was vulnerable enough to hang naked on that cross, if he was vulnerable enough to put it on for all the world to see, he said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw men unto me. If he was willing to do that, I could be willing enough to step into a little bit more unity because it's in that place some of us are asking God for blessing. Some of us are asking God for breakthrough. But we won't even be nice to another person at church. Some of us are believing God for our greatest breakthrough yet. And we won't say hi to somebody. I know it seems real simple. But if we'll begin to walk in unity, it is there that that oil begins to run. It's there that it begins to flow. It's there that God commands a blessing. And I'm telling you, church, with where we're headed, I believe unity is more paramount than ever. And when we know the story of those around us, 
we get to link arms together. And when we link arms together, there the blessing is commanded. Amen. Hallelujah. Why don't you lift your hands to the Lord right now? All over this room. Spirit of God, we thank you for your presence in this place this morning. We thank you, Father, that you're breaking jealousy this morning. You're breaking selfish ambition this morning. You're breaking the things that so easily divide us, God. I thank you for the testimonies that are in this room, God. For the times that you've delivered. For the times that you've set free. For the times that you've healed. For the times that you've provided. For the times that you've been faithful. And we know that if you did it once, you'll do it again. And so, Father, this morning, I pray right now that every stronghold of disunity, every spirit of offense, as we dealt with it Wednesday night, I pray now in this corporate gathering that this morning it would be completely broken off of this house. And I thank you, God, that you are faithful. Oh, you're faithful. I thank you that in your faithfulness, God, you'd move among your people to set free, to deliver, and to heal. Father, I pray this morning. I pray, Father, that every person over the years that has been offended, I pray this boldly this morning, God, that you'd hook them by their jaw and bring them home. I pray, Father, in our families this morning, where there's offense and strife and jealousy, that you'd heal it, God. You'd restore families this morning. And I thank you, Father, that you are faithful. That you who began the good work are faithful to complete it. And we thank you for it this morning. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Welcome and thanks for tuning in to this week's life-changing message from the Equipping Church. My name is Pastor Jacob Biswell, and I have the wonderful privilege of leading the Equipping Church here in Bryan, Texas, where we exist to win the lost and equip the saved. By tuning in this week, we have a couple of hopes for you. That number one, you'd encounter the Lord, that you'd be equipped by His Word, and then you would take that Word and extend His kingdom wherever you go. For more information, you can visit us online at www.equippingchurch.us. Thanks and God bless you. We hope to see you in person soon.